And so a lot of these families, they don't have connections within their near community that are outside of the refugee community. People who help them find better opportunities, who love them with all their heart because they've walked through hard things with them. If it's in your heart to make that kind of an impact on the life of a family, okay, this is your chance. Welcome to another episode of Relentlessly Resilient, presented by Minky Couture, a weekly podcast where people share real-life experiences and the tools they develop to move forward and live their best life. I'm Michelle Scharf, and unfortunately, Jenny Taylor is not able to make it with us today, but I am blessed to be sitting here for a second hour with Mrs. USA, Mandy Anderson, and she has been delighting us with honest, vulnerable, authentic stories of her own personal struggles with depression, mental illness, suicidal ideation, even suicidality, as well as her big platform of supporting refugees. And I love your conversation that we had in our first hour where we talked about how we can heal our world and we can help those that are being displaced and misplaced, (laughs) as the case may be. And we're going to talk more about that and how people can actually get involved with that. Before we get started, I want you all to know that we are sponsored by Miki Couture. And if you are looking for the most luxurious, softest blankets to cuddle up with, Miki Couture is the place to find them. We are so pleased to have Miki sponsor our show with the most indulgent and highest quality you will ever find in a blanket. I know you'll just love them. I have several of these blankets and I give them out all the time as gifts. Treat yourself or a loved one to the gift of comfort today. Visit them in store. They have six locations in Utah or online at minkycouture.com and discover why Minky Couture is the ultimate in luxury blankets. So today we are here with Mrs. USA. Yes. Again, Mandy Anderson and We were talking, like I said before, in the last hour about a couple platforms that you've really decided to share and be vulnerable about. And I really appreciate your willingness to talk about these sensitive conversations. I wanted to revisit a little bit about mental illness. And, you know, you likened it to like when you're in those darkest moments, they're dark and they're deep. And obviously, if they're pertaining to suicidal ideation and suicidality. And you've been struggling with this recently, and as you've been able to actually take this title, which is really in and of itself just an amazing feat. I mean, obviously, God has had a hand in this path for you. I wanted to talk about just a little bit about that mental illness. You said those darkest places are dark, but coming out of them, sometimes it's hard for you to even understand why you got thinking in the way that you you understand when you're outside of it that your thinking was off but you don't really understand or remember the darkness that was there and why you got to that point and so I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about that you do have a therapist on board and, and you're in therapy let's just start with this first question what is suicidal ideation what does that mean well, I'm not an expert in mental health, except for that I've struggled with it my whole life. Mm-hmm. So in that way, I feel like an expert only on that part. But as I understand it, it is this kind of longing, a wish almost to just be done, be dead, um, that your your family would be better off, the world would be better off if you weren't here, just having that desire to be gone, that it would all be better if you were gone things would resolve themselves if you were gone. Wow. Which is frequently and often not the case. I've had many friends take their life, unfortunately. I don't know if it's just you live long enough and you have enough friends that it's going to impact you. Right. And I would say most of them really did believe that things would be best without them, but it's just not true. And they leave a long legacy for other people to try to figure out what they could have done. And so it just kind of displaces whatever was going on for them onto multiple people all around them to try to piece it together and trying to figure out what did I not do or how did I not show up? So it's an interesting disease because 
I mean, clearly, if the person could have that understanding, they would probably not take that yeah. that step of actual completion. We should probably say, like you said, you're not a mental health expert. Okay. I'm not a mental health expert. We do have mental health resources in our country. You can text 988. There's a 1-800 number. You can Google it, National Suicide Hotline. And anyone who's struggling, who has heard this, who feels heard, or maybe you haven't been able to talk to anyone about this, please reach out and find the resources that you need. And like I said, you can text 988. Somebody will talk to you. Or you can Google the National Suicide Hotline. And we'll also include it in our show notes. Yeah, and I think also... One of the biggest, I don't know if you call it a trigger, but for me is feeling like a burden. And most people, when they see, oh, you're a mother of eight, you are Mrs. USA, you have this platform, you're needed. They would say, how do you feel that way? How is that even possible that you feel like you're a burden? Recently, I was told by my therapist that I was autistic and I've known that for at least 18 years because um, when I had my one of my children diagnosed when he was really young and I didn't know anything about autism at that time but when I when I had him diagnosed all of a sudden all these light bulbs went off in my brain and I'm like oh my goodness I just grew up thinking I was backwards there was no place I fit in you know I never felt in any room I ever walked into that I belonged there wow. um I remember telling my brother once when we were very young, you know, people were talking about, oh, I'm having so much fun and this is so much fun or I just love doing this. And I thought, I wonder what they mean by that. I had no concept of fun or enjoying the things that I could see other people enjoying made no sense to me. So from an early age, I just had to learn to pretend to watch other people, how they view things and how they act in certain situations and then try to mirror that because otherwise you know it's called masking <laughs> I have a I have a slew of autistic people in my life <laughs> I yeah. just learned that word but I'm like yeah. wow I've been doing that my whole life because if I act like even in this moment the way I feel I'd be in that corner over there in the fetal position covered in that blanket <laughs> so that's how I feel most of the time and so my therapist was mentioning, okay, for autistic people, intrusive thoughts are a lot more common. So these intrusive thoughts of, you don't belong here, you're a burden on your family, you make everything worse. And just all of the things that you've been told all through your life because you were different than other people. Um, I was always the ugly one. I was always the one that didn't fit in. I was always the one who nobody really wanted to sit by. Um, and so to recognize that, okay, those are like there's a name for that. It's not just me and I'm not just crazy. It's everyone has those. And I saw, and this is why I love to talk about this. I don't love to talk about it. Let me just scratch that. I don't love to talk about this. This is why I keep talking about it, even though I hate talking about it. Does that make sense? Um, I saw a reel on Instagram the other week and it was somebody playing out their intrusive thoughts and the amount of comments on that reel, telling how grateful they were that someone actually posted that because they thought they were the only person that has these thoughts of like, oh, I'm just going to drive off that cliff or I'm just going to, you know, oh, there's a knife right there. I think I'll cut myself with that. You know, like people get these things in their head. They never talk about them, especially if you came from a family like I did. If you said that, it's not acceptable to say that. Mm -hmm. But if you feel like you're the only one having, so it sounds like to me that. like so. I don't have any personal experience with this. I don't Bless understand <laughs> it. I I know, and I I'm sorry that you've had to deal with this. But hearing you explain it to me is like a light bulb for me. It's the intrusive thought. It's almost like an impulsive thought. It's like a random thought yes. that just pops into your head. But then it sounds like it's intrusive in the way that it doesn't go away. It just keeps reintroducing itself. Yeah, it can come back. And I, for one, have certain intrusive thoughts that come over and over. There's some like that just come and go. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's natural for anyone, I think, Mm -hmm. to have just thoughts that are like, wait, of course I'm not going to do that. That would be ridiculous. I'm I'm not going to do that. 
but there are other thoughts um, that kind of maybe obsessive. you, yes, obsessive thoughts or, you know, thoughts that match what you were told when you were young or that match your own, like maybe your limiting beliefs or whatever. They sound so true. I had an experience, it was maybe 10 years ago. And it was the first time this had happened to me in this specific way. I was working on my computer editing pictures. And I usually did that after I put the kids to bed because otherwise it just takes 10 times longer to accomplish. So I was sitting there. My husband was upstairs working on his invoicing for his business. And I was fine. I was perfectly fine. All of a sudden, five words just came into my head and they were so piercing so honest that I thought they came from God because they were, it pierced me so quick and so deep. And it felt true because everything I had felt or believed about myself and been told in certain times of my life, it felt very true. And um, those words were, it's always been you. And to me, that meant you've always been the problem. In every family situation, it's always been you. And the thought that immediately followed was, you need to die. And in that moment, I was ready. Suicide had never really crossed my mind. Mm -hmm. I had lost family members to suicide. I had no real deep understanding about why this happened. But in that moment, I went from fine to, oh my goodness, I've been a burden on every person I've ever known. And I felt I was being prompted to end myself right now Mm -hmm. Um, from God, from God, because Mm -hmm. I thought, well, he's the only person that can, who knows me well enough to pierce me that quickly in that, who knows that I would immediately know what those five words mean. And so the next thought that came to my head was, if those thoughts came from God, why don't you pray and ask him what he wants you to do with that thought? Mm -hmm. And (laughs) And I thought, I... I'm afraid to ask because in that moment with that thought, I thought if that came from God, he's angry with me. Um, so I was afraid to ask him, (laughs) but I felt, and I, I know (laughs) often in my life, there's been angels guiding and supporting me and directing me. And I just felt someone just say, ask. So I did. I said, heavenly father, I've just been told that I've been the problem my whole, whole entire life. Everywhere I've been, I've been a burden And I feel like you would like me gone, that you're so disappointed with me that you want me to leave the earth and stop being a burden on my family. And the next thought that came to my head was, go right now upstairs and tell your husband. And so I was like, I was a sobbing mess at that point. I couldn't even breathe. I was was so attacked that I could not breathe. So I gathered up a little courage and walked up the stairs, my poor husband, (laughs) the sweetest man ever, ever. He just looks at me and he, no idea what's going on. And it took me, it was so difficult to just tell him these thoughts because of course I felt like, of course he's going to agree and be like, yes, you're a burden. You know, in my mind, it was so true. And he just said, honey, that's not how God speaks to his children. He does not speak in that way. Even if he wanted to rebuke you, he would not do it in this way. Those words are not from God. And so he sat with me and until I felt, okay, we prayed. Um, I received a priesthood blessing and I learned on the other side of that, okay, that isn't how God would speak to me. But yet I wasn't sinning in that moment. I wasn't thinking bad thoughts about myself. I wasn't doing anything to invite this thought Mm -hmm. that just came literally out of nowhere. And I would have ended myself that moment because I believed it with my whole entire being. Wow. That's a lot. (laughs) It's a lot to carry. Yeah. appreciate you sharing this. I'm sure there are going to be people listening that have had the same thing. We've had some other guests uh, uh, on about mental illness. And I do agree that unless you've dealt with it, you just can't possibly understand it. 
I uh, have a daughter who has severe anxiety and depression issues. And after having her, I went through a period of time where I had postpartum anxiety disorder. And so I had a little bit of knowledge that allowed me to have compassion towards this child. Otherwise, I don't think I would have really understood ever what was going on with her, right? right? And so sometimes I think, why did all of that have to happen? But then I think, but it gave me the ability to have compassion and love for her and understand that these things were not her fault, that they're not of her choosing. Right. And I've had similar situation this year. Like I said, it really just came on really strong all of a sudden on one day. And then I've just been dealing with it. And I thought it came on strong. It'll go away like that thought that came years ago. And it's just been dragging on for this whole past year. And it, you know, I have times when I'm upper a little bit, but it's been mostly down. But I, I've had the same thought, the same prayer, like, why am I going through this and why right now? Mm-hmm. And it became really clear why right now. And I can't get into a lot of details about that, but depression and anxiety comes through my family. There's been several suicides in my family before this, and it was just never talked about. But to know that I also pass that on to my children, mm-hmm. nothing I could do about it. I, right. I had no power over that. I wish I did. I wish I could take that burden and just keep it to myself. But apparently I don't have that power or capacity. And so I also had that experience of knowing why. Why me right now? And it was because I needed to be able to remember how this felt. I felt this way other times in my life. And I've gone through really long periods of of depression, anxiety. But to have it like recur right now... It needed to be right now because just like birth, just like I was talking about again, you don't remember. And so when someone comes to you or you find out about someone really close to you who's going through something like that, you would not remember. And then those really unhelpful words come to your mind, like, just go for a walk, just just do this and you'll get Read over your it. Read scriptures, pray yes, more often. pray harder. And that's, like well, I said. And while those things may be useful for some people, they're not the cure for mental illness. Right. They're not going to help you resolve it on their own right and they've been a blessing but yeah it's been also a blessing for me to know that god sent this certain therapist to me because i need a therapist (laughs) he didn't tell me read your scriptures more or you're being bad he said here's someone who you need go and talk to her she can help you so i think it's important too that's that is really important no it's so good thank you for sharing and being so vulnerable with that because it would be easy to have this title and this platform and then not be honest about it and just hide it more. And I think that that would probably make the problem worse. Yeah. But I can really appreciate that you're like, no, I I felt directed to compete, earn this title. I have this title and now I I'm going to be a voice and be able to use my voice to help others. And that is amazing. So thank you. My pleasure. I will. I would say my pleasure, but it's actually really hard. (laughs) Yeah, it is really hard. And, you know, it takes courage to be vulnerable, to open up your heart, especially to people who sometimes the world's not so kind to, which leads us back to the conversation on refugees. (laughs) (laughs) So tell us about the work that you're doing with refugees and the organization that you're so excited to talk about. Yes. So I have worked, like I said, on my own with refugees for seven years. And most of the work that I've done is just, you know, I'll find out about a need of a family. Maybe they have no food in their home, which happens a lot, Mm -hmm. a lot. And so I will post on Facebook and friends and family will bring donations to my porch. I call it my refugee porch because when I ask, it comes I've never been let down. So I will go and I'll take that food or those consumable items like toilet paper. I can't tell you how many people are excited to receive toilet paper. And that's humbling. Um, But I'll take it and then they will invite me into their home and I will sit with them like I'm sitting with you and I will listen to them. And I have a very special friend from the Congo and she was one of the very first refugees I ever met. I have a story about her and I don't know how, if we have time to go over that, but 
I had a dream about all of this work that I'd be doing when I was three years old. And I've kept that in my heart and remembered that dream until this time. And I'm an old woman at this point, and so it's a long time to remember this dream. In that dream, if I had time to tell you all of it, there was a woman who stood up, and I recognized her in this dream as a three-year-old, and she recognized me, and we just walked to each other, and we hugged, and she said, my sister, my sister. When I met her in this life, and I have and it's funny, her name is translates to angel, and she is, she is an angel. When I met her, it was as if my dream was playing out, but in, in a different way, because obviously when you're three, you're going to understand things differently. But when I saw her, she recognized me, and I recognized her, and I knew that she was part of my plan. I knew that this work that I, I felt compelled to do, to find ways to serve refugees, was part of what I came to earth to do. And that's one thing that keeps me going as as far as mental health as well, is just knowing that this is something I was sent to do. So right now, there's a new program that's been rolled out, and it's it's almost a year old, but it's just kind of rolling out here in Utah, and it's called Welcome Corps. And when I heard about it, my heart literally just jumped out of my chest because over the last seven years, people who supported the work that I was doing would say, what could be done more? What's missing? What do they need to be successful? This is it. Historically, um, when refugees are held, come, they escape their country and they come to one of many UN refugee camps. And then they wait until a large organization like Catholic Community Services or someone else has the resources and can show they have the resources to bring them here, that they'll have somewhere to live and that they can help them find a job and that kind of thing. So they wait for somebody to accept them. And it's always been handled by these really large organizations who then work with other organizations like the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who, you know, they'll work, one will be a sponsor and a case manager, Mm -hmm. and they'll work with these families for usually once they're settled And it varies between families and their needs, but the minimum is three months for that case. And sometimes it goes longer if there's special circumstances. But after that case closes, many times what I've seen is these families are forgotten. They don't know who to turn to. After three months, if you've ever lived abroad, or I was thrown into living abroad and I didn't speak the language. So I have a little bit of understanding of how this can feel. Mm -hmm. After three months, I'm still really disoriented. I'm still not feeling like I could be successful in this country. And so a lot of these families, they don't have connections within their near community that are outside of the refugee community, people who they can network with, who can help them find better opportunities, who love them with all their heart because they've walked through hard things with them. Welcome Corps is putting some of that into the hands of citizens like you and like me and giving us the opportunity to form groups of five or more adults and becoming a sponsoring group. Mm. And that sponsoring group acts as the sponsor and the case management group, but they're overseen by other organizations. Like I'm working with Utah Valley refugees. Um, I don't work for them. I'm just helping direct people to them. And they have just been certified to work with Welcome Corps. And it's such an amazing opportunity because you get to, in some cases, you may do fundraising to help earn enough money to to sponsor. So if you've ever known someone that needs to move here from another country, Mm -hmm. you have to have a sponsor no matter what. And the refugees do too. You have to show you have a certain amount of money so that they're not going to be living on the street Mm -hmm. once they get here. They're not going to be homeless. And so for each individual refugee, there needs to be approximately $2,500 in an account somewhere that you can prove that when they come here, you can help them. So, so your group of five will be doing a lot of different things, but one of them is meeting them at the airport and welcoming them. But before you even do that, you're going to be locating an apartment and helping stock that apartment with food and beds. If they have a baby, getting donations of baby clothes, preparing a home so they have a safe place, a welcome place to come, then bringing them to that home. And then for those first three months, that's what they ask, a minimum of three months that these this group of five 
will be the support system for that family, bringing them to English class or um, helping them get oriented in their neighborhoods, showing them the grocery store, helping them get a bank account, all those things. There's a lot that has to happen in those first three months and it's time intensive. And the amazing thing about Welcome Core is, like I, I think I mentioned before, I've known some refugees that have been in a camp for 20 years before being resettled here. And the thought came to me the other day that if, imagine a baby being born in Uganda who had mm-hmm. whose mother had fled the Congo today and the baby was born today, that baby most likely is going to be in a refugee camp for at least two, three, four, five years of their life. Most of the developmental things, <laughs> mental, physical, uh, emotional development happens in those first five years of life. What immeasurable impact could you have on the life of that child to get them to a safe, where their mother feels safe? <laughs> that makes a huge difference on yeah. a child if their mother feels safe. But get them to a place where they have nutrition, access to schools, access you know, to a, um, a safe place. People think refugee camps are safe most often it's just not the case. They think they have enough food, they have enough water. It's just not the case. If we could get that child to the United States two years earlier than they would have, it would make an incalculable difference in their life yeah, forever and in the life of their children. Right. So as we discussed in our first episode, generational trauma, right? Yes. So yeah, so it is critical. And the first year is super critical, but those first five years are the foundation for a person's entire life. Yeah. Yeah, so so that's amazing. So that's amazing work. Can people that are interested in participating with uh, Welcome Core, where do they go? Well, I would love it if they reach out to me, if they live near me, because I'm still looking for my group of five people. Um, it turns out it's easier to earn money than it is to get people to offer their time. And I totally understand that. Um, I've seen that over and over over the last seven years. People will donate money, but yep. they can't donate time. But um, Utah Valley Refugees is one of the organizations that's spearheading with Welcome Court, and they have offered to go to any location with me. If anyone would like to have an, an informational meeting or organize an informational meeting near you, the CEO is willing to come. I will give you an informational meeting. It is a lot. It is a time investment, and I think that sanctifies people. Mm-hmm. And you will be changed forever. Your family will as well. So welcomecore.org. You can learn a lot about it there. There's also, just so people know, there's other organizations in Utah that are also working with Welcome Corps. So if you don't live in Utah County or Salt Lake County, you can find another, I can help you find an organization that if it's in your heart to make that kind of an impact on the life of a family and to be part of their life forever. I mentioned before, there are several families that call me sister Mm -hmm. and people have been like, I want that for myself. And I'm like, okay, this is your chance. Right, because you impact them for the rest of their lives. Yes. Well, that is amazing. And we will also include that in our show notes as well. Thank you. Before we go, I'd like to ask you, what does resilience mean to you? So to me, it's just what my therapist has been telling me this whole year. If you can't think about getting through the whole next week, or even the whole next hour, think about just getting through the next minute. Can you make it one more minute? Can you make it five minutes? Mm-hmm. Take that next step. Take one more breath and just wait. Just see. Yeah. Just see. Taking one more step into the darkness and hoping. Hope is a huge mm-hmm. thing for me. And just hoping that, okay, in five minutes, it's going to be a little less painful, just like with birth. After this yeah. one, I'm going to have a little breather and then it's maybe it starts up again but right. I take one more step that's awesome in our first episode when when you were talking about your journey and your struggle with mental health you talked about having a friend a therapist and your husband 
And I would say that most of us have somebody in our life that we can reach out to. If you don't, you should reach out to 988 or Google the National Suicide Hotline. But part of resiliency is gathering a support network behind you. The first step is to acknowledge things for what they are, which clearly you've done. But the second part of that is to gather a support group where you can actually ask to have your needs met. And so that's so good that you have that. And um, for our listeners, I encourage you, even if you're not in a bad place right now, find out who are your SOS friends. Who are you going to reach out to in a time of need? And reach out to them now and say, hey, I feel close to you and I feel that I can trust you. And I want you to know that if I ever get in a hard place, I'm going to have you on my list to call and ask them or volunteer yourself to do the same for them. Right. 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 And building connections and setting these things up in advance is a real good way to be resilient and build resilience in our life. So thank you for sharing today with us and providing insights. And really, you've outlined a full step of resilience, several steps of resilience today in both part one and part two. So thank you so much for coming in and sharing with us. Yeah, Thank you so much for having me. And Tell us again where to reach you. Okay, yeah. I'll be sharing all about my own personal journey there too on my Mrs. USA Woman of the Universe Facebook and Instagram pages. I thought it would be awesome to show people, take through people through the hard and the joyful parts of the whole entire journey so they can see if she can do it with eight kids and the severe mental health struggles right now and, you know, being Mrs. USA, if she can do it and she's scared of people anyone can do it really so it's such a great story so reach out and also if you're interested in hosting a family and would like to partner with mrs usa Heck yes um, she would love to have you on her team of five so be sure to to reach out and if it, your heart is called to do this it, it would be a great opportunity and a chance of a lifetime to work with mrs usa yeah. who wouldn't want to do that <laughs> If you've enjoyed what you've heard today, remember to subscribe to the podcast. You will be notified of new episodes. We drop one every Thursday. We would be so grateful if you'll give us a rating and review. Also, if you or you know someone who has a story about real life that they've experienced and the tools of resilience that they've used to live their best life, send us an email at rrpodcast at ksl.com or you can find us on Facebook at Relentlessly Resilient on Instagram at Relentlessly Resilient Podcast, both platforms have a Calendly link set up and you can set up a time to pitch your story for our show. Please do reach out. We'd love to have you on the show. And remember, oh, before I get to reminding people of what to do, I want to give a shout out to our amazing producer, Kelly Ann Halverson. She does so much for the show, the editing, and she's just We couldn't do it without her. So thank you, Kellyanne, for that. She's asking me to hurry up and close it up because she's embarrassed. But (laughs) um, we want you to remember, whatever you do today, remember to be kind. You have no idea the struggles others are dealing with in their lives. Go out and have a great day.